to know a little bit more about joint supplements. Do you want to find out about Antonol, a product that's been brought out on the market that definitely has made a massive difference to my dog's life and certainly improved the quality of life of one of my older dogs? And you can find out a little bit more about that. Join me in today's conversation of lifting all ships with Chloe White of Antonol. <music> I'm so well, thank you. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Thank you very much for doing this. Uh, how are you enjoying the sun, I see, in the background? Um, yeah, I mean, actually, it's quite grey here. I'm not quite sure how I'm getting away with this blast of, like, um, you know, light You've in the background. You've got somebody out there with a big light, haven't you? Shine it for your window. Uh, yeah, I've got my entourage. Yeah, um, yeah no, I, uh, I'm i very, very well. I could do with it being a little bit warmer, but then everyone else will complain around me. So yeah. at least I'll listen to that, hey? <laughs> So let's dive straight in then. Obviously, you, uh, our relationship started from obviously um, the, the Antonol, the company that um, Chloe works for and works with, reached out to me to become one of their ambassadors. And it's a fantastic, fantastic pro, uh, product. Uh, and it's essentially a joint supplement that has been an absolute game changer, certainly for one of my dogs in particular. It has it's been a huge, huge impact in him. And it's definitely helped all my other dogs, but it was really, really staggering the differences made with him. So let's dive straight in and find out about obviously who you are, what you do, and a little bit about Antonol. Well, firstly, thank you very much for having me. This is actually the first time I've been invited onto a podcast. So wow. it's very, very surprising. I've hosted lots of like episodes and interviews, but yeah. this is the first time I've been invited onto one. So I'm really, 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 really grateful to be here, Kamal. So thank you my, very my much. My pleasure, my pleasure. Um, so a little bit about me then. So I am a registered veterinary nurse. I qualified in 2013, um, which seems a very long time ago now, but also not very long ago at all. Um, and always had a passion for, you know, just small animals in general. Um, don't go bigger than anything other than a bigger than an Irish wolfhound don't do horses or anything like that um even though you'll be like hang on you've got a big picture yeah, yeah, yeah. behind you mm -hmm. um I the thing for me though was when I was in practice uh, I absolutely loved my job and what I did but I wasn't a very good veterinary nurse and the fact that I didn't actually really enjoy stabbing things or upsetting Seeing them, I just wanted to love them and you know just make them happy, you know. Um, and one of the ways of doing that was through food. And um, I am a feeder, um, but I absolutely loved how animal nutrition could be one of the biggest like changes we could make in an animal's husbandry without ever having to be invasive. Um, and so I started doing like nutritional cons consultations, especially um, in regards to weight clinics. That was often like the biggest part of my job because we do have very overweight, obese population of pets. Yeah. Um, but I just loved it. I absolutely loved it. And from there, I then um, got a job with Hills Pet Nutrition. I was with them for six years and then got headhunted by Antonal to work for them and go and move into the joint supplement space. Well, I say joint supplement now, but now it also has, you know, loads of other kind of wide reaching benefits. But initially we were just looking at it being a joint supplement. So, yeah, I um, have also become a published author in nutritional welfare. Wow. Um, yeah. And I've done a, a small animal certificate in nutrition as well. And I, I just, I just love it. Like I'm really wow. fascinated by it. Um, and yeah, it genuinely makes a difference. And when you look at all of the kind of the data and the more, the more data that's coming out about nutrition and it's kind of, um, support in our dogs and cats lives it you know if you can feed the right stuff and feed the right balance of things regardless of whether you choose to feed home cooked raw or like you know shop bought um you will find that you know the right stuff will make a difference so yeah i've been working for antonin now in november it will be five years Wow. Um, yeah, and I was here for the original um, launch of Antonal uh, in 2019. Mm -hmm. It was really exciting. Um, you know, they presented me with a, a lot of really great information, you know, uh, when they asked me to join the business. And I was really blown away by kind of the level of the information that I was given and the detail, um, you know, right from science to manufacture to customer care as well. Um, 
the vision was always that it was going to be like the Ferrari of supplements. Yeah. Um, and so as part of that, it was like, well, if you buy a Ferrari, you expect Ferrari customer service. And that's something we're really passionate about as well. Nailed that, yeah. Yeah, well, we'd really try. And, you know, there are lots of people, I think, think we're this massive behemoth of a company. Um, but there's actually only four people that work within Antonel UK. So, wow. you know, we are, we have our CEO, we have our digital marketing guy, we have our uh, commercial partnerships manager, and then we have me who does all kind of um, veterinary and technical partnerships. So we are Diddy, you know, but it's good in a way because, Although we're, we're a little bit overworked in the nicest possible way. Um, we all have animals. We are all passionate about animals. And we genuinely like cheer on when we see our pet owners come back and say, oh my goodness, it's made such a difference, you know, or, you know, somebody I will share a post about Antonal and, and how, it, how much it's helped. And, you know, it's nice because we're all kind of sharing that experience of, of, being genuinely pleased and, and wanting that, to that definitely comes across i would say um from the, obviously the relationship that i've had with you and i think one other person in the company um when i was liaised with you that definitely definitely jumps out so tell us a little bit about antonon who are antonon where are they based and what's you know okay. that yeah so we have two founders uh we have dave and kev who are both na native australians and 10 10 ish years ago um they were basically saw this product for humans, which was Lipronol or PCSO524, which is the active ingredient in Lipronol, which is, is the human version, slightly different formulation to Antonol. Um, and they could really see the potential in it. And it just so happened that somebody used it in their pet. And I'm now trying to remember who it was, but basically they used it in their own animal and they were blown away by how much it helped support their pet. And because they were more interested in pets than they were in humans, they actually decided to kind of uh, found Vets Pet and actually make Antonol B, the dog and cat version. And they've always been driven again by science and results and also um, sustainable manufacture and supply as well, because marine sourced supplements, you know, you do have to be conscious of where you're taking your, you know, the, what the, from the environment in terms of the aquaculture. So yeah, always kind of, again, trying to deliver a product with excellence that is excellent. And I, their kind of main mothership is Japan and Tokyo. Um, but from there, we have hubs in Thailand, Australia, New Zealand, and now UK and Europe. So wow. yeah, it is it is growing. We are becoming uh, bigger and bigger, uh, but it is um, perhaps maybe a little bit like a, a slower speed to other companies um, purely based on the fact that we are, again, trying to operate in a responsible and ethical manner which sometimes means things take a little bit longer which is yeah, a bit but, you know you have to sleep easy at night and I think that's such an important part of any business and certainly you know I get approached to be blunt by a lot of companies to in um to you know be sponsored by them or to validate them and I tend not to form relationships with any company that I feel that I that doesn't have the same um one passion for animals two is their moral and ethical compass and obviously, when I was approached by Antonal, it was definitely something that definitely made me consider them as somebody I'd like to work with or have that relationship with. So I think it's worth, you know, you have to be true to yourself. So were, are they from a veterinary background, the founders, or was it just from... No, no, so um, not at all. So um, Dave actually worked for Coca-Cola for years, but got bored of like that big, massive corporate craziness yeah. as I'm sure you can imagine um and Kev's kind of like started and sold on lots of like businesses here and there um but they've really found a passion for ownership of vets pets because of their own passion for their own pets so Kev is the cat person Dave is the dog person um, and they both have their own strengths that they bring to the company which is which is which is great um but yeah and they you know they are supportive founders in the fact that if I have like an idea and I'm like guys mm. let's do this you know I, I pretty much can be like they can you know they're they're pretty supportive on it of it and I'm really glad that you feel that way Kamal because mm -hmm. it's something that's really important to us in terms of you know when we look at partnerships of people um you know we 
could definitely you know we do partner with some of the best you know like canine sports people in the industry but for me as well it was always well what are you like with your dogs do you you know do you adhere to positive reinforcement yeah. methods yeah. or do you know also I think for me as well and sometimes there's um an argument for certain breeds of dog as well you know like we're trying to kind of operate with people responsibly in that manner and if we do you know we're currently um looking at doing a partnership with a, an owner of a dachshund um or two dachshunds but both have got quite severe issues and you know part of that dialogue is well how should we be supporting these breeds of dog better um you know so it's always kind of making sure that and i always talk about it being a partnership not a sponsorship right yeah. it's like yeah. I, I really want to support the people in our network that have frankly supported us from the beginning you know um, we've had a bit of a rough time in the sense of we launched in 2019 and then I don't know if you noticed but there was this big plague oh, yeah, that, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so that was kind of that was quite yeah, tough I know, but... that isn't always the best thing for business really the best no business. right it was it was pretty tricky wasn't it so that that it's you know it's been really really hard and for me the north star has always been where you know I'm like oh this is so tough can I do this anymore and I'll get an email from somebody you know just saying I just need you to know that you know my dog was going to be put to sleep um and now they're not or somebody that came to us a few weeks ago saying that they've been able to cancel has the dog surgery because of the fact that the improvement is so good and the the vet is blown away by, yeah. by it. Yeah. um that is the thing that's like my north star and i'm like yes and i can kind of gird my loins again and go yeah, yeah. And again you know but um yeah. do you know something that's such a one of the best pieces of advice that i know i was given and that resonated with me certainly in the pandemic was don't build a business build a community because communities will stand by you businesses people will look at it as can i afford that you know entity you know with money's tight you know especially in the pandemic everybody was questioning how are they going to survive and, you know, how they're going to function. Whereas if you create a sense of community and it, it's a two fold relationship, it's two tier, like you as a, as a leader in that community, you need to obviously support those people within it and vice versa. And that's certainly, it's certainly something that I think is uh, worth considering. And I think that definitely resonates with Antonel. So yeah. in terms of, um, you've obviously mentioned several things that I just want to um, pick up on. One is, um, uh, for my own personal experience, and I'm always cynical about using any any product. I'm a little bit, but in the same as myself, Reed, I'm a little bit like you have to convince me. And obviously, I, I started using Antonel with an open mind. And with all my other dogs, I'd say you definitely, I thought, oh, you know, they were, oh, there was nothing that I would say, if I'm being honest, that I had any major concerns with. It certainly has aided them. And I'd say, yeah, they they all are really, you know, healthy, etc. The biggest one that I'd say absolutely I, you could literally see the dog physically change was my 14 year old um, German Spitz. And he was, a, he couldn't, he'd got to the point of where, you know, it was that he, you know, he's older, he's physically, um, you know, is what it is. So I was very realistic about his health, et cetera. And to the point of where he really didn't like to go out for walks. So I tapered his exercise, which is what happens when they're older. You sort of like allow that to happen. He has, you know, um, various uh, chiropractor and health checks. So I was very much a case of, it is what it is. He's getting older. I'll taper things down. And I, I gave, you know, there's all with all my dogs. I started giving him Antonel. Honest to God, within two weeks, I was like, "What is up with that dog?" It's like that. I could literally see him going from being like he went from being a dog that he just slept all day, literally slept all day, and um, he he was just um quiet. So like he now he's running like with uh, with my young dog like hooning around and stuff. So, like honest to God, I'm like, what the hell's happened? And the only thing that I can apportion that to is Antonel. And I wouldn't, if I'm a truthful guy, I wouldn't have believed it unless I'd seen it with my own eyes. I was like, there's nothing changed in this dog's life to the point of now he's back. He goes for four walks. He doesn't necessarily go for the four walks every day because sometimes you have to hit. You can yeah. yeah. You've got to be realistic, but he goes for four walks. He's like running around, you know, and you think, Jesus, it's, it's like he's extended his, his literally his life. So um, what is it then that's so different about Antonel to other things on the, on the market? I think there's a, a couple of elements, really. 
Absolutely. So um, basically, when it comes to joint supplements, and like bearing in mind, I've this I've said this is the first podcast that I've been on, and I'm going to be cancelled before I yeah, yeah. <laughs> chance to go on another one. But essentially, it's the omega three. So the omega threes, in terms of when you look at the science, are time and time again in the best kind of comparative analysis are proven to be the most effective. Right. Uh, versus glucose and chondroitin versus turmeric you know yeah. all of those absolutely if you want to use them if they're appropriate for your dog but never at the cost of using omega-3s always prioritize omega-3s and it's really important where you get your omega-3s from so i know lots of people say oh you know i'll get omega-3s from salmon oil yeah. and the tricky part with salmon oil is that one of the things that's been found for uh, omega-3s to be beneficial when it comes to mobility is that you have to have a high level of omega-3 and a low level of omega-6. So generally it's a two to one or a three to one ratio of lots of omega-3 and then less omega-6. And that's because omega-6 have actually been found to be pro-inflammatory in a skeletal disease such as osteoarthritis. Mm -hmm. And so with um, salmon oil, they have a one to one ratio. So that will not be very effective for managing mobility. It could be helpful for managing skin and coat health, but for when you've you know actively got a mobility issue, salmon is not one of the best things. Um, also, it's how it's stabilized. So omega threes, loads of evidence brilliant you know kind of nutritional additive to kind of get into your dog or your cat to help with supporting mobility and any kind of inflammatory process mm -hmm. but they are highly liable to oxidize in air so it is vital that as part of the manufacturing process that those um, essential fatty acids are stabilized one of those best ways to do that is in is encapsulating it within a capsule anything in a pump or a liquid form has been found to degrade the the concentration of the omega-3 oh, is much faster mm. yeah okay. so you know there's a lot of evidence to show that um actually we sh you know from even from manufacture to the first pump to the last pump that you may not have the same level of essential fatty acids because of that oxidization mm. and you know if um if it's something that you reach for occasionally and you keep it on your shelf for a while even more that it may not be beneficial for you um, or your dog or cat, but I do know people that take it for themselves as well. Um, so for me, it's the fact that it has an appropriate ratio of omega-3s, that they are stabilized, and that's part of a unique manufacturing process that only we do. So that is how Antinol is different. Um, and because of the fact that we literally just use the oil extract, it means it's highly safe as well. So it doesn't contain any phosphorus, which some of kind of some supplements do. They use like a phosphorus binder to kind of put all, all the components together, which, you know, in, in a geriatric patient or pet might not be that helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so those are kind of the elements for me, which make Antinol more different. And that kind of more potent and stabilized product means that you can actually feed less as well. So if you have a big, big, big dog, um, then Antinol might also help with that because you can actually feed a lot less than, than you know, some other com com like comparison products. Yeah, yeah, excellent. I mean, um, as I said, from personal experience, I can't believe the difference it's made. And I've always, you know, there's lots of trains of thought about whether supplements help or hinder. Sometimes, you know, it could be a placebo effect, you know, mm -hmm. but definitely for this, it wasn't, you know, I was like, this dog has literally like changed drastically. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I sort of resigned myself that he was on the, you know, the gradual downward incline. Now I'm like, Jesus, this dog's going to be around for another 10 years the way he's going. So that alone is massive, you know? I think placebo effect, though, that you touch on that is really, 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 really important to consider because in a lot of um, nutritional evidence, um, people are seeing, if, if, when I say people, caregivers, so pet owners and veterinary professionals are seeing placebo anywhere from 45 to 75% of the time we're seeing placebo yeah. in that yeah. when we actually analyze them um, with basically um, a machine, uh, that improvement isn't actually real. Yeah. So it's really, really important that although we may perceive that there is a difference because yeah. we truly want to believe, you need oh, to yeah. be confident that that product, you know, is better than a placebo. And so um that's where some of the skepticism comes from with supplements or they say well it's just a placebo effect but yeah you're right when it's such a marked improvement you know i remember um a vet that had a german shepherd and it was having to use uh, a um 
a route to get in and out of the car. And the guy, the reason he was like, right, I need to stop this product immediately was that he was getting the ramp out of this car. You know, he'd had to use the ramp for literal years at this point and the dog jumped over the ramp and he wow. was like, uh, what? And oh. I said, well, perhaps try not to let him do that because there's still a mechanical problem there. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it, it's amazing. And it's, you know, I, it is important to say it won't actually help every single person and every single individual because yeah. you know, all dogs are individuals. And so yeah. we do have times where they're like, you know what, it didn't work for my dog. And sometimes that's, you know, we're sometimes the last chance saloon, you know, they've tried everything else. They can't have certain drugs and they're just, you know, they're like, well, I need to try something and it, and it doesn't work. But the thing is, we always kind of support with our money back guarantee and things like that. So, you know, we try to offset any kind of placebo benefit by supporting owners with that. Um, but, it, you know, yeah, most of the time uh, we get lots of success stories. And I, mean, you know, I love the fact that you do that, Chloe, because it says that you believe in the, the product and that you're happy to say, like everything, it isn't going to work for every dog. And that's fine. It doesn't mean that it's a bad product, et cetera, or not to consider it, because that's how all these things work. You know, they, you know, even conventional medicine, you know, conventional um uh, painkillers and and steroids there is a there is a limitation to all these things and it's being aware of their place in the care of your own individual dog and that as you say your dog yep. every dog's an individual and you need to be aware of that yep. so i just yep. want to go back to one other uh, point that you raised earlier in the conversation which is something that definitely is a pet peeve of mine it is the and which follows through to osteoarthritis it is the i would say the um uh, epidemic of overweight dogs and cats oh you're gonna get me started now. <laughs> and it is it is a real real like bugbear of mine um mm -hmm. and there's a massive 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 disconnect in and i you know not all but uh, even frontline vets about what is a healthy uh a dog in good condition versus a dog that is overweight and i would say you know being transparent my dogs are probably on what most would consider the leaner side um they're very fit and they're very well exercised etc so i would expect that of them but i definitely see um a lot of dogs that with my clients dogs or when i deal with um domestic pet dogs that are definitely overweight so what's your thoughts on that and why is that the case um so i think as um a human population within in the uk and also it is six sends out to any kind of first world country really yep. is that actually as a human population we're overweight or obese and we do tend to show love through food uh, you know being feeders giving treats etc and you know i love giving my dog treats i love showing her that i love her you know but i completely i'm in the same pack as you come out that i've been told oh your dog's a bit thin no she is lean and i keep her that way because she is the german shepherd cross mm -hmm. and so the one of the reasons it's really important to keep them leaner is because there was a study done that showed even if the dog was overweight or obese, um, but even if they were just over overweight, they were clinically proven to live for two years less mm -hmm. than the slimmer individual. And that still boggles people's minds when I talk about that. And that's because they were more likely to be put to sleep because of uh, obesity or overweight associated disease. And like when I explain this to people, and this is what I used to talk about in my nutritional consultations, I was like, who does not want their dog to live for as long as possible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I my dog's going to live forever, yeah. right? Okay, so that's fine. Um, So if you can keep them with you healthy and strong for as long as possible, A, why, why would you not? Yeah. Why would you not? But I do get there's a lack of education. I do also understand there's socioeconomic problems that come with overweight, you know, individuals and pet food. And there's yeah, yeah. Like a, there's a big thing. But if you can, if it was if it is within your power to keep them slimmer, mm -hmm. please do so for that part, because they will just be with you longer. Yeah. The next part is because of its association with inflammation. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of people think that it's just the weight on the joint that causes an issue when we look at joint pain and you know things associated with that but they've even proven now that essentially if you have a big enough layer of fat it almost becomes its own endocrine organ and what I mean by that is that it's able to act in and of itself and able to produce inflammatory cells so if you have a, a dog that is already in an inflammatory process because it has osteoarthritis because it has hip dysplasia that layer of fat will produce more inflammation that will make that disease inherently worse and the problem with inflammation is that it causes more inflammation which degrades the joints causes more inflammation 
inflammation, et cetera. So that's inherently worse when you worse when you have an overweight or obese individual. Um, and actually that's worse when you have any inflammatory disease. So, you know, with cats, with they get a lot of urinary problems or any kind of inflammatory kidney issue or skin, you know, if you a dog with really bad skin, well, perhaps there's also a fat layer that's contributing to the chuck out of the inflammatory cells. So in terms of wellness, I know it's irritating if people are like, your, your dog is overweight, fat, obese, whatever, but there's a really good reason to, to make them not be because it will massively improve the quality of life of your pet. There was one study I think that showed that even getting 10% of that individual's body weight off improved the pain score um, in those individuals. So it inherently improved quality of life. So it's really important, not just for joint, but if you have an individual suffering with any kind of inflammatory disease whatsoever, please I will go on my scabby bended knees and beg you to try and get some weight off your off your pet because it truly truly will help well I know in um uh Dr Habib and Karen Becker they wrote a book called The Forever Dog and I uh if I I'm not don't quote me verbatim on this but I think there's three factors when they looked at the long the oldest dogs alive um there was three things that they noted were this consistent uh, or, or the dogs that had longevity. One was exercise, the amount of exercise they got a day. The other one was diet, what they ate. And the third entity was their weight. They were all what they would say would be on the lean side. And you go, it makes sense, doesn't it, really? If you think if they've got good diet, they're eating the right foods, if they're getting sufficient exercise, keeping their body fit, et cetera, and they are the right weight, that's going to make a massive difference. And as you said, who wouldn't want to extend their dog's life? At the end of the day, we're all passionate and we love our dogs. Surely, you know, we want to keep them uh, going longer. So definitely, I mean, uh, you know, it's such a it's such a common thing. And I and I also think it's, there's a massive link to behavioural issues. You know, if a dog is in uh, carrying excess weight, it's going to be in a level of discomfort, or it's going to be let you know not necessarily receptive to training, especially if you're using food that then makes it difficult and so forth and so forth is it can sometimes be a dive in spiral so for me that's a big 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 one so what would you say is the main um reason that people come to you and uh, about Antonel? what is the most uh common is it um pain and discomfort is it just uh, you know, i think it is mainly um mainly geriatric you know individuals and people sort of support wanting to support geriatric individuals or those that are you know that the owner is very aware that they're suffering we do have a smaller proportion of incredible proactive owners who yeah. are you know sometimes just very experienced dog owners who know how this can go and yeah. they're like i'm going to do everything as as much as i can and i and i celebrate you so wholeheartedly yeah. um and, the, you know, people say, oh, is it ever too early to start? No, you know, it's never too early to start, you know, supporting your dog's health and well-being, like never. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I would always say it's never too late to start. Yeah, yes, like I, like I mentioned, like, yeah, some people come to us as a last chance saloon and it doesn't always work, work out. But I think there's definitely an element, certainly for me, is that if, if it were my dog, I'd want to feel like I'd done everything before we had to make that final call, you know? And so, um, you know, I have people that you know, are coming to me with their first diagnosis and they're like, I, I don't know what to do. And, you know, I, we will always support people in, in that because there's a lot of evidence, again, to show that people looking after a sick pet have the same kind of stress burden as those looking after a sick child or a sick parent. They literally, you can track kind of the, the mental well-being of that caregiver and it, it tracks as the same. And so I've had people being like, oh, you must think I'm ridiculous. It's just a dog. I'm like, no, you will not hear that from within our team, you know, we totally totally get the impact that such a big day. and the thing as well when it comes to osteoarthritis it is essentially a condition where we are having to give palliative care and that makes people wince when I say it but there is no cure there is yeah. no cure at this stage and so yes it is a, a piece of palliative care but what's great is that there's loads we can do to support them so you know it's not like cancer where it's like oh you know we potentially have um 
more limited treatment options yeah. there's a spectrum of things that we can do to support yeah. that individual um, and yeah. multimodally you know in so many different ways and the multimodal approach is, is definitely the best way to be like supporting your dogs if you can you know good diet supplementation ensuring that their weight is off if you can take them for hydrotherapy physiotherapy yeah. And um, ensure that your environment is right. You know, you're not kind of dragging them up and down stairs, the slippy no. floors, all of that kind of stuff. And um, there's loads that we can do. Um, and obviously, pain relief, etc. If the, if the dog needs it. Um, but yeah, I would. Uh, we kind of get people from from all walks of life, and we welcome all walks of life as well because it's it's not something you know. I've I've recently had um, somebody reach out to say that their dog has already been diagnosed um, with OA at just under two. Mm-hmm. Um, so again, this is not something that just affects elderly dogs. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, I think um, it's something that interesting that you said right at the beginning, Kamal, was that you know I could see that you know he was changing but I wasn't concerned because this was part of like his life cycle and I I completely agree and you would you you were doing all the steps to support him but I think what the only thing in in the thing that I would be like guys please is in terms of if you think that your dog is in pain please seek help because too many people still go oh well that my dog's limping but he's not in pain yeah if you're your dog's gait has changed to accommodate something that could be pain and therefore please reach out to your veterinary team for help do not do not accept pain on behalf of your dog ever please one second second, hang on i think the just give me one sec so yeah you raised some really really um interesting points there and and again certainly i've had um, two dogs in particular that had osteoarthritis and they were related and it was definitely something that was uh, prevalent in that particular line of um, their relations, etc. Um, and it was really, really, that was, this was years and years before, you know, and so was even in existence. And I, you know, tried to find supplements and, and diet changes, etc. And it took me on a real journey to understand how, um, you know, there is so much that you can do and you've got to look at these things holistically. You know, I was really militant about the exercise, the surfaces they walked on, you know, the the their exercise regime, their fitness, their weight, their conditioning, to try and keep them healthier for longer and to obviously alleviate any discomfort. So it's worth, I think, I think there's definitely a lack of understanding. I mean, you know, funny enough, I was driving um, uh, to a console and as I was driving along, I saw three different dogs that all definitely, definitely had some sort of lameness I- issue. And the owners were, you know, walking them. And I don't know the background to them. I'm just seeing little glances a- into a snippet of time. But I definitely think there's a there's a, a, a lack of understanding uh, about looking at your dog's well-being and health beyond just... Because what tends to happen is where I'm normally consulted is people say, oh, my dog's reactive. He has a behavioural problem or he's, he's um, got really funny with the kids. And when you actually look at it, you can think there's actually other stuff going on than uh, there. And I think we, as as professionals, certainly from my perspective, we should be thinking the physical entity should be the first port of call. Right, let me rule that out. Is there anything physical going on with this dog? Is it physically in, um, a level of discomfort or pain or uh, or um, unhealth, uh, unhealthy? Right, now I've dealt with that. Now I can get onto the training of the dog and hopefully the behaviour modification. Um, but it's not something, you know, certainly in days gone by, we never considered pain wasn't, you know, the first thing on, our, on um, I'd say in, when I got off the arc and trained dogs originally, it wasn't the thing that people considered. It was, oh, the dog's being naughty, he's been this, he's grumpy, etc. And now I think it's there is a shift in the industry, but it hasn't quite trickled down to grassroots dog owners. And I think having these sorts of conversations is really, really important, really. Um, so in your experience of working with Antonol and seeing the impact, what do you then, um, you know, where do you see it? going where do you how do you think uh you can get the message across to people then i i would love more people to be using it earlier you know um it's tricky because there's no clinical evidence for any preventative effect of of anything you know Mm -hmm. not pharmaceutical or nutraceutical um but that's because no clinical work has ever been conducted. And I think if you look at like the evidence for omega-3s in the diseased animal, you know, we'll use that kind of inverted comma, um, there's nothing to suggest that if it 
if it doesn't if it works in a diseased animal why would it not work in an animal that is clinically well you know if it's has to work harder in a diseased animal then why would it not work it in a in a you know yeah yeah Mm -hmm. and prevention is always better than cure right and so and i think yeah like the the multimodal approach is something that's really 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 helpful and so for me i would love for more people to yeah start earlier um definitely what you were saying about behavioral changes like just be more aware of like of behavior because actually when it comes to you know dogs and cats cats even more so if you are if you have people that follow you that are also dog slash cat owners is that change that happens that give you a clue as to that there might be something going on are usually behavioral or lifestyle changes you know you say that whole oh well he's a grumpy old man now and I'm like that now hmm you're you're kind of intimating that that hasn't always been the case so I think for me I would love for people to be more aware of the fact that you might actually there's evidence so that you might not see changes in your you know your pet's gait until you're in the end stage of disease and that's a disaster in terms of us trying to you know extend like longevity of life and it's really important that you know it is about quality not quantity we're here for a good time not a long time you know and so it's really important to be ensuring that that what we get is the good part right and not we're not just kind of dragging it out but yeah for me I would love just for us to be part of a more kind of preventative conversation for us to be part of you know just generalized like a well-being thing we are really really trying to push and um, cat you know cat well-being as well because as far as we've come with dog cat is like you know even when you look at the science there's there's just like of, of anything if you look at mobility behavior there's just there is what there's this much on dog and then there's this much in cat so I'd, I'd love to be like the more of that part of that you know just improvement in welfare conversation conversation um I think I think there's a really exciting process for the use of you know supplementation stuff in dog sports I see great stuff in um in a, you know in agility and yeah. you know in obedience but I've even been seeing conversations today about how far behind it, like working sheep dogs yeah. are in terms of wellness etc I would also say like police dogs yeah. and, and military service yeah. dogs yeah. how far behind they are yeah. and that they you know they could be so much better yeah. And, you know, even if you think of it incredibly cynically and you're like, well, you know, it's just a dog and it's a tool, even if you are of that school of thought, and I doubt you are because you're listening to Come Out's podcast, but even if you are that cynical and you think of it as a tool, do you maintain your tools? Mm -hmm. Do you look after your tools? I think you probably do. And that should extend to the thing that's actually like a living, breathing creature, right? And who for you and who also probably adores the ground that you walk on so um yeah I would love for there to be a greater movement to being proactive rather than reactive that was a very long way of saying that so I I, I absolutely and I'd say you know anybody that's listening to this podcast picks it up on the the tinternet um that is in law enforcement or military anything like that I definitely think that's such a valid point and it's not to say that they don't you know I know there's some phenomenal uh, uh, service handlers, service dog handlers that that have that incredible insight of their dogs, but some maybe not, and I don't know whether it's standard practice. But you know, if you're going to feed your dog good food to try and you know keep it fit, and you know we've seen certainly in the media at the moment there is um, um, because of the various things that are going politically in in in, in our country, you see um, dogs at the front line doing what they do best and keeping officers safe, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, certainly in the military, they've been used and they are, you know, they are worth their weight in gold. Um, And I think it's worth considering if you want to extend their um, their working life, their career. You know, it's such an investment to raise and train uh, and to bring on a police dog or a service dog. Surely you'd want to extend that beyond the standard eight years. If we can push that to 10 or even 11 uh, and who knows where longer, depending on how well you look after them, surely that would be more cost effective for the service. It would be more beneficial. You've got uh, um, a reliable, you know, well-versed um, partner to work with. Surely as part of that, considering um, using a product like Antonel would be fantastic. I'm sure if anybody's listening, reach out to Antonel. I'm sure they would probably be able to work with you and give you some support. Yeah, um, so, um, so in terms of your um, 
your insight into, for obviously from a, a veterinary nurse background, um, and moving into what you do now, what is your um, biggest, I suppose, um, passion that you you think is the because um, that's a meeting of two different worlds. You've got, uh, you know, you've obviously in the front end, like you said, you know, sticking pins in dogs and necessarily putting them to sleep wasn't really your thing. So you now moved into. So what what do you would you say is your your biggest passion that ended up um, uh, allowing that to happen? Then what was the the thing that drove you in that direction? I think it was definitely nutritional welfare. You know, I felt like I, you know, I could make just as much of a difference to animal welfare. And I always loved teaching. So when I was a qualified nurse and I would coach the student nurses, I absolutely loved it. And as when I worked for Hills, a lot of my job was teaching. And so for me, that kind of driving of education um, so I have like, you know, my kind of my three E's in terms of the fact that the education equals um, empowerment, which equals enrichment. And I think I could make more of a difference to more animals by kind of teaching a man to fish. Right. So I could support more people. And the same with Antonol now is that I can reach more dogs than I ever could in clinic and cats um, because of the fact that I have um, I don't want to say greater pool of influence because that sounds a bit ick but I feel you know I can reach a, a greater pool of pet owners and so for me I feel like I make a bigger difference than I did when I was in clinic and so I yeah and you know I I love teaching and I love seeing people get that aha moment you know and also one of the things is like when I would sit and like listen to people kind of then talking about what I had taught them and go yes they've nailed it you know yeah. and um seeing people get passionate about it and get empowered to make their own recommendation and then they go on to make a difference and that's what education does it makes that kind of ripple effect so for that for me that's always been like the driving force for for me and you know that's why like I do um talks at agility competitions you know I, I'm more than happy to come on a podcast and chat because I just love sharing learning and I'm one of these people that are very much in that curve of I don't know anything because I there's so much more to learn and the science is always changing which is great you know coming from a veterinary background there's so much skepticism about supplements and stuff yeah. which is you know wanted in a lot of in a lot of cases yeah. but you know we're never going to sit here and be like oh well we've done everything because we've we've done x amount of clinical work well we're done now you know if we had that kind of mon mindset we will that let we we did good when we got rid of cholera you know great yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's kind of you know we, it yeah. was always moving it's always changing and even things that you know, I rec I, I'm not that old, but even though where things that I recommended when I was in clinic, we'd never do it now. You know, one of those things is cage rest, post kind of post um, cruciate surgery. I've just, you know, recently been to a veterinary um, OA conference. And one of the biggest things about uh, the things that was coming home was that um, one of the physios said, it, I would class it as negligent if you keep a dog in a cage um, six weeks post any ortho surgery 24 hours rest max and you should be trying to get them up and move them and start to move them in that time blew my mind blew my mind because you know not far back so long ago yeah. we were recommending a, a protocol completely different and so there's always more to learn there's always more to explore and so yeah education for me is definitely something that I try to do myself and then try to, to disseminate it out to a level that's appropriate for anybody who kind of reaches out really. Yeah, you know, the, the two things that really jump out to me in that statement was one is, um, and hopefully people will pick up on that, is to follow your passion. Now, I, I, all the people that I speak to have a passion for something. It might be dog training, it might be a breeder dog, it might be, you know, helping people, whatever. And I think if you allow that from a career point of view, you know, you start as a veterinary nurse and look at the doors that open as a result of it by really channeling into your passion is the one thing. And the other thing is being open to to changes and open to um, uh, having your belief system challenged sometimes. It's like even there's been a shift, isn't there? We're talking about, you know, shift about um, uh, post um, uh, operation, et cetera, and getting your dogs moving. That was, as you said, that's something that's a shift in the um, veterinary profession uh, uh, away from cage rest, et cetera. Similarly, about exercising dogs and how at one point it was you, you were militant about it. it was, I think it was one 
what was it one minute for every month or something like that now that's changed as well five five minutes for every month yeah and then now that's evolved to go actually it's not to say take the dog over to the park and chuck a chuck it for half an hour but allowing a young dog to move and to use its body is actually conducive to healthier longevity so again it's and i think it's being open to ideas it's being receptive to different trends of thought it's looking at at the end of the day we all want the same thing which is we want our dogs to be healthy we want them to be happy we want them to live their best lives and we want them to be around with us and in our lives for as long as we possibly can have them so if we look at their education if we look at their enrichment if we look at their physical health and their the way in which we look after them we should always be willing to explore. I mean, even like they're now the, the the probably the most topical conversation is about gut health and how gut health is can make such a massive difference on the dog's behavior. It's oh, like, yeah. you know? mm-hmm. So all that is, is a new frontier that we're pushing. You know, they've done a lot of work on um, n- neurological studies. Now they're moving into, you know, gut health and how that can affect behavior and um, and well-being and health, et cetera, et cetera. This, and, I, and I find that in itself so exciting and, and I think that that's a really great takeaway that you made is being open to, I suppose, having your viewpoint challenged a little bit. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I'm a very happy go lucky, positive poly type of person. But the, one of the biggest things you'll see me get irate about is, you know, that attitude of, well, back in my day, my cat lived for 15 years and yeah. we didn't do anything. And blah. And oh. I'm like, lucky you. We're lucky. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. lucky. You're so lucky that you've got that because that is not you know the narrative for everybody else and I think it's really important that there was a great phrase that I once heard from um a you know board registered nutrition uh, veterinary nutritionist that she said um the uh the plural of anecdote is not data just because you have had that experience lucky you but that is not the experience of everybody else and so you know yes perhaps you've always been very very lucky and you haven't had to do anything and and and, well hey well done but actually when we look at trends and we look at science and you know we do try to work in an evidence-based you know veterinary scientific basis just like the NHS basis um is that it is looking towards that you know science-based approach that is not just you know one person's opinion on on that yeah it's great that it worked for you but that might not always be the case that that just you know that that thing worked for one person and I think yeah definitely be allow yourself to be challenged allow yourself to learn be curious be open-minded you know what's what's the worst that can happen oh okay you you were challenged it didn't work out but what if it what if it had and so kind of having that more sort of open-minded you know glass half uh, full approach yeah, yeah, yeah. I think is, is better for you know, being more open-minded to opportunities that will will certainly help because we would never have progressed in science if we weren't that glass half full. You know, if we all just went, well done guys, we've done it, we've achieved. Yeah. Um, You know, we would never get to where we are now and I'm really excited for what we'll achieve in the future and what we'll be able to do to intervene and support and, you know, that, you know, as I say, you know, I've, I've been in the veterinary industry for just over 10 years and I've already seen such positive change. And so, you know that's be open yeah definitely be open yeah no that's great no look I uh, that's such a nice place to draw these conversation to a close in that you know to summarize uh, summarize the message that you know you as an individual and certainly I would say that's what comes across at Anson all the the willingness to obviously um look at themselves produce a product that is ethical that is uh, you know based on science that is you know, showing it can do what it says on the tin, so to speak. Um, and, that, and you you use the phrase, it's the, the Ferrari of supplements. I would go further than to say, I think the company and the way it treats its clients and its consumers, et cetera, definitely are, are meeting that standard. So, so thank you very much for your time. I really do appreciate it. It's been great talking to you. Really, really interesting. If you're interested in finding out more about Antonol, you can check them out on www.antonol.co.uk. Very good. Snaps yeah, for you. Yeah, uh, I'll share <laughs> the the, um, the um, uh, description if you want to check it out. But thank you very much for your time, Chloe. I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. If you enjoyed this conversation about Antonol, and uh, you can definitely check out their products on their website. Joy, just hit click and subscribe so you never miss another episode of Lifting All Ships. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it and see you all next time. Mm-hmm.